So when my first child died was my daughter, Stefante, right? So she lived for 10 minutes. And then when DeMarcus died, that was a major loss for us. So for 15 years, I was depressed and I was volatile. Papa, Stefan, oh my God, when people would say, you're just so strong. <laughs> I used to resent that. I'd be like, bitch. <laughs> I'm not this strong, you know, like, I'm not this strong. I don't want to be this strong, you know, because the Bible says that God won't put on you what you cannot bear. Who wants to be able to bear this? I've worked through that now. I take it as a compliment now, but I thank God that I am a woman of strength. I can tell you that the proudest moments of my life are the day they shut that fucking freeway down. Sacramento rose up. This makes me cry. <laughs> As me and my friends got in my car and got on the freeway to go, it's because we were gridlocked. Where they shut it down for Stefan, we literally got out of our cars. We just started partying on the freeway. I see everyone around me looks like me, and his, the energy was crazy, right? When I seen them shut that freeway down for my baby, that's when you believe in your culture. You believe in your people. And they know that I'm Papa's mom. It makes me proud. That's his nickname, Papa. When he would come in, that's the song we sang. Throw your hands in the air. Stefan was tall. It was chocolate. Stefan was black, black. He had a six pack, beautiful teeth, beautiful smile. He always had a nice haircut, always had at least $1,000 in his pocket. Stefan was always flamboyant. The only thing Stefan ever loved, really, was his kids, Cairo and Aiden. His kids were his heart and joy in life. Well, early in the day, me, my husband, and Kaylee and his sister went to church. He said, Grandma, I'll be right back. I'm going with my friends. I was at the computer later on that night waiting for him to come back. So all of a sudden, I hear something go, pow, 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 pow. Door, I went to this window and I started screaming. I seen Papa land there. I came, I started screaming to my husband. I said, they killed him, they killed him. Hi, I'm Adele Coleman. Thank you for tuning in to Say Their Name, brought to you by DCP Entertainment. This series takes a deeper look into the impact of the assault and killing of Black people by the police and in Stand Your Ground states. We share the stories from families who have been negatively impacted by the police. We did not talk to officers or to governing bodies, just the families and their support systems. We are not the court of law, nor do we try to be for legal purposes. We are not here to presume guilt or innocence for anyone because, quite frankly, we do not want to be sued. We simply want to give the families a voice while examining what happens when the hashtags stop and the news cycle unfortunately moves on to the next big story. All we want to do is give the families the opportunity to control their narrative and share ways that we can all help. Warning, some of the discussions may be particularly disturbing and even emotionally overwhelming at times. When one of those moments occur that may be particularly triggering, you will hear this chime. For more specific details on the timing of these moments, please visit our show notes. On this episode of Say Their Name, we focus on Stefan Clark. On March 18, 2018, Stefan Clark was killed by Sacramento police officers in his grandmother's backyard. Inside the home at the time were Stefan's grandmother, grandfather, and little sister, all of whom narrowly missed being hit by the officer's stray bullets that entered the home. As Stefan's grandmother, Sakita Thompson, was just realizing what had happened outside of her home, word spread fast to the rest of the Clark family, including Stefan's mother, Sequette, and his younger brother, Jalen. I'm upstairs. We're in uh, these apartments. And my auntie Shanita, she's staying them right across from us. I'm half sleeping. She's here yelling my mom's name, my name and shit. I'm like, she's probably just tripping. And then I get up, I'm like, well, she's not tripping. And I just go out there, outside, knock on the thing. Somebody answered. 
He was like, uh, yeah, my auntie was trying to get y'all. She said, Papa got shot. I'm like, damn, bro. I'm like, do you know if he's alive? He was like, oh, no, bro. You got to go check this, this, and that, this, this, and that. I'm like, all right. Instantly go to my mom. I was parked somewhere waiting for this guy that I was messing with. Right? And he wasn't coming. And so I, I seen all these police kept going past me. I was like, let me go home. You know, so I went home. And I'm sitting in my car playing Candy Crush, right, on my phone. And so Jalen, my baby boy, he comes out. He has a blanket wrapped around him. He comes out. He's like, Mom, what are you doing? Right? With agitation. I'm like, I'm crushing candies, boy. What do you mean? And he's like, it's Papa. I was like, what? He's like, he's been shot. And I look. And Jalen drops. He collapsed in my face. And I just, just like, what the fuck? So I got out. I picked him up. And I walked him into the house, and I'm like, what are you talking about? Papa got shot. He's at Grandma's house. I'm like, is he dead? He's like, I don't know. I'm like, get in the car. It's like 2, 3 o'clock in the morning. We're driving here, and I was crying like crazy. I couldn't see. I started praying as I was driving. I was like, Lord, just please don't let him be dead. Please don't let him, just please don't let him be dead. And I remember God saying, do you trust me? And so then I start saying, thank you, God. I just thank you that your good and perfect will be done. And I remember Jalen getting mad at me at one point, like, drive, right? Like, I think I was swerving because I was crying. I couldn't see. I just, it was the, I think I've never in my life been that scared in my life. We pulled up, so they had everything blocked off, all yellow taped. So when I seen the yellow tape, I knew he was dead. We're pulling up. So you really can't even approach the house. We like all the way down the street from there. Yeah, we pulling up and shit, and we on the phone with grandma. Grandma crying. Yeah, I think grandma's telling us he gone. And I was like, fuck, bro. I was just so sick. They had my mom and dad still in here in the house. They had Kaylin in the house. My 10-year-old was sleeping in the back bedroom, right where the bullet holes went, into the, right by her head. My mother crawled on the ground to save Kaylin from the gunshots. And then Stevante had pulled up. We had to tell him he had left work. So I had a little thing with me on the work site. And we was, you know, doing our thing. And then I got a text message that said, Little Papa dead. He got a text from Kaylin, my daughter, my 10-year-old, saying Papa's dead. When the text message said Papa, it was P-O-P-A, not P-O-P-P-A. So I said, oh, they playing with me. I was like, girl, you said, huh? Come on, we got out. Left the work site. As soon as I got on 29th Street, it was police lines. Seeing one of the officers. He said, uh... Crime scene can't go past. I put out my ID and I said, nah, look at my ID. I live here. I can go here. I'm going home. He said, nah, you got to wait. I got to call a detective or something. I said, hold on. Y'all fucked up, huh? He said, nah. Detective came. He looked at my ID. He said, oh, no. I knew my brother had died right there. Held my composure. I went around to the other side of the street to see if there was another access point. I get to the other access point around the corner from the street. As soon as he got out of the car and started walking up to the yellow tape where Jalen and I were standing, they drew down on him. They drew down on my baby just for walking up because his walk was so super confident. The rookie cop drew down on my son. Jalen tried to leap across the tape at the officer. Uh, it took one of the sergeants, an older gentleman, to come over and he literally lowered Ricky's gun. So it's like, damn, bro. I'm ready to kill another one. I was just like, fuck, bro. Hell, my composure. My mama Clark is there, a few other people. And they are highly emotional, and they tell me my brother's dead. And the first thing I did was apologize. I kept saying I apologize to my mother and my family. Because I knew... Stefan should be alive. You know what Stevante told me when he pulled up? 
He said, Mom, I can't do this again. He said, I don't want to do this again. Mom, I don't want to do this again. And I felt him. Who has to go <laughs> through this again? Man, that whole night was a blur. I don't even think I remember that whole... I don't remember how that night ended. It's a lot of shit from that night I don't remember. Man, I can't walk up and nigga, check on my grandma, nigga, this, this, and that. Kaylin was there in the house. It's just traumatic. I can only imagine for her. Because I'm like, damn, I lost my older brother. But, like, to actually be there and listen to the, you know, the gunshots, it's just hard. And so my daughter was behind where they was blocked off. And all, everybody, the family and everything. My neighbors, they kept them outside for the longest. Can they bring Kaylin down there? Because they won't, nobody can't come up to the house. So we all went back to my house. Me, Stevante, Jalen, Kaylin. They were smoking weed. <laughs> I think I hit the weed, which I don't smoke weed. And so I hit the weed and I, I probably passed out. As the horrible news began to set in, the family began to learn the circumstances that had led to Stefan's killing. It had all started with a 911 call from a neighbor. 911, what's location of the emergency? Uh, you know, this guy's going down the street breaking windows of cars. He busted both my truck windows out. He busted these in the people's backyard right now, uh, across the street from my place. What did he use to break the windows? I have no idea. I came out and I, I heard the noise. I came outside and he was standing right along the side of my truck and I grabbed my ball bat. I was gonna, you know what I mean? But I, I didn't hit him or nothing like that. He's in the okay. backyard right here right now. We have officers on the way right now, so we have the helicopter coming out too, see if they can see him. Yeah, we're actually pulling someone from another district to come to come down. It's been a busy, busy, night, huh? busy weekend with St. Patrick's Day yeah. and everything. It's been nuts. Oh, but yeah, that's, right. that's why we're getting the, the helicopter out there. They can get there a lot faster and they can kind of keep an eye out. And if right. they see him, then they can watch him, you know, until the officers get there. Right. Yeah, we don't need nobody running around here breaking windows at cars again. No, I agree. I'm glad you saw it. Yeah. Most of the time, uh, it's once by the time you get out there, they're already gone. Yeah, you know, I got a whole, my whole truck, I got trucks full of tools. I mean, I'm a mechanic, so I mean, all my tools are my trucks. So, I mean, I heard that and I went out there and he's lucky to be alive. I would have gotten a hold of him. <laughs> Does he have, I did be. he grab any, any of the tools or anything that you know of? No, or? no, he, okay. was, he was just, it was weird. It was weird was he was just standing next to the truck, right there by my door. And I watched that and said, excuse me, who are you? What are you doing? You know, and then, and then Peter I realized, Paul. oh, I looked at his, and I saw my window was, was busted out. And, uh, that's when, you know, that's when I went after we took off. Oh, gotcha. Okay. And now we have two um, ground units coming, too, that are on Meadowview right now. So they're okay. about a block and a half away. They took the dude that who called 911 across the street. They took him to jail, and he said they beat him up. And then three days later, on March 21st, police released audio and video recordings from the officer's body cameras the patrolling helicopter, and audio from the police dispatcher. Stefan's brother, Jalen, was one of the only family members that was able to bring himself to watch the footage. I just broke the window, running south, running to the south. But he's one house to the south right now, gonna run, okay, he's running towards the front yard. What you're not able to see while listening to the audio from the helicopter is that Stefan had jumped over a neighbor's fence into his grandmother's backyard just as officers were approaching him from the street. Out of respect for the families, we do not air recordings of their loved ones being killed. But as the officers approached the driveway, they did so with weapons drawn, chasing Stefan further into the backyard. And within seconds of their first interaction with Stefan, they fired 20 shots at Stefan while they took cover behind the side of the house. Not too many of my family watched it, but for some reason I was like, I gotta watch it, like, I just wasn't comfortable with how many times they played it. I think that was, like, the only thing that stuck with me, that they kept playing those gunshots, just replaying it and shit. It was just, like, fucking living it over and over again. And, like, fuck, that whole situation, it happened so fast to where it was like, damn, how could you, how could you even tell that fast? It was a split second, you know what I'm saying? He tried to say it was a crowbar he had and shit, and he was breaking into cars. 
this, this, and that. And it's crazy. And now that I look at it, all they was really doing was just trying to justify why they killed him. And not really getting down to the facts of the case, like he didn't have a gun. They just trying to justify them fucking shooting 20 times, emptying a fucking clip on him, bro. Like, there's no point in y'all emptying a clip on somebody who don't got a gun. The fuck? He's no threat. He wasn't breaking in the cars. But matter of fact, it wasn't even him. It was a dude from the Job Corps. And he admitted it, that he's the one that was doing the windows and stuff. That didn't come out. They were saying that Stefan was breaking in the cars. But they had the guy who was at the Job Corps across the street turn himself in for bringing the one that was breaking into the cars. Afterwards, that first week, they were following my mom, videotaping her alongside her in her face for her to see, just blatantly fucking with us. The helicopter that dispatched the officers to kill my son, they would fly over my trailer at 10.30 every night at the same time my son was killed. Every night, they would fly over my trailer like, literally driving me crazy. And the person that I was with, my significant other at the time, he thought I was crazy. He thought I was going crazy. And I was just like, look at the time. Like, look at the time. Like, look, bro, they're back. Like, every night? Are you serious? Because they fucked up. But now they want to try to fix their fuck up by fucking us up. Like, how does that work? Still only days after Stefan's killing, the story began getting national media attention. Stefan's grandmother was doing TV interviews in her home, recounting the experience of hearing the shots that killed her grandson. Meanwhile, Stefan's brother, Stevante, took on a difficult task of being the family's official spokesperson. I'm gonna be out there on TV, people gonna know me. I don't need people recognizing me. But on a higher level, past interviews, past talking, past performative activism, you don't have to like me. I'm just the messenger. I'm just the voice and vessel for my dear brother, Stefan Alonzo Clark, I'm just his communications director. Stevante is his mama, okay? Can I say that? Okay. <laughs> I was weak. Proud. <laughs> when he took the bell. <laughs> First, let me express again my sympathy here. How's your family holding up? How are you holding up? What does that mean? Next question. Okay. Um, obviously, you are in grief right now, and listen. I'm I, not I, in grief. All right. We haven't slept. We haven't ate. The media keeps following us everywhere we go. The only person that got the message, and that was just before we came on the air, was the mayor. We're going to work with each other. We're going to work with each other. I love my city. Mm -hmm. I, I'm sack strong. I did all this for my city. We, we are the example of how to do it right. The, what the media does, they wait till a loved one dies, they find out it's a tragedy, they swarm that person, they put them in grief, they ruin their lives forever. Mm. Their but, lives are never the same. Don Lemon, let me talk to my people, okay? Yeah. You black on black, let's be black now. Don't you do that down, Don Lemon. We well, love I just want to tell start. you that. I just want to tell hold you on, that the on, media. Hold on, hold on. You, you, hold on, hold on. I'm not blaming the media. Okay, okay. I'm not blaming. But the way you guys treat us, you guys, I told you I stopped calling out. We have, how many phones do we have in the family? Can you, can you let me get a word Seven, in, please? Because I, I, listen, I have to manage eight, the time here so that we can get something out of this interview because a lot of people are watching. And you're, you're through the media, whether you like it or not, your brother's story will be told the media is giving you a we platform love Stephon. i am yeah. Stephon. Yeah. don lemon say his name so tell me about your brother please don lemon say his name stevante uh listen you're in grief i'm sorry for it for that he's not going to say know his how name. it is we'll never do seeing it you I messed up on name. Lost you sent our driver as well and i that's messed up i thank we you so much you, for joining lemon. us and Black my heart you. my we heart you, goes don. out for you we thank love you CNN. thank you thank guys. you brother all right stefan told me never shake left hand with your right hand though you know what I mean? So we have to be strategic with our tactics when it pertains to this fight. So when I found out Stefan, yeah, I was I was fucked up. I don't know where I went after that. Shortly after that, I started fighting. I had to stand off with the police for 30 minutes. Live, and I cussed them out and all type of stuff. It went viral. 
And I jumped on the mayor's desk And I had a Burberry scarf on That was wrapped like the Taliban I jumped on the mayor's desk And I caused some noise It was him and two of my nephews When they got to the city council um, They were immediately escorted Into a private room The police ushered them Into a private room And then flooded the room With like 30 officers So Stavante As a survival tactic Ran out of the room And jumped on the desk in front of everybody, like, you can't touch me in front of everybody. My nephews that were there, who were protecting Stavante at all costs, because I asked them to, that's who tells me my stories. So they told me what happened that day. No, you're not going to read it, but that's what happened, and there's three different people as witnesses to it. He don't like that day at all, because he got the most ridicule from that day in the media's eyes so he thinks that that was like a bad thing a bad look for him but it was the thing I believe that really caught the world's attention like in that video where he stood on like the mayor's desk and all the other shit he was having a mental breakdown bro like he was saying some like crucial shit in that segment he was talking about the gang and the homelessness and just getting together as a community but what a lot of people don't realize is that he was going through like a mental breakdown, like that shit was actually fucking him up. And then fighting along as this shit goes on, the news want to give him interviews and shit. It's a lot to take on when your brother just died and killed by the police. And like, there's not really nothing you could do about it. But, like, it's a lot to take on at the head. And he was at the center of it. I say like, man, that nigga, bro, he fought harder than all of us. For real, because, man, I couldn't do that shit. I was telling him, like, bro, I could now. I, could, I wasn't even thinking about doing this shit fucking when he died. Like, bro, I'm not going to lie, bro. I was just going to fucking lose it. Like, but he was like, we got to fight. Everything, the first year running has been all Stevante. First year running has been all Stevante. And so when Stefan died, with all of the publicity... So I was back on drugs, homeless again. And then Stevante and my mom are being catapulted into the forefront, right? I'm like mad, jealous, vengeful, resentful, sad, all wrapped up into one ball of energy, you know? It wasn't a good time for me. Stevante said, you need to go back to the Women Overcomers program. You need to go back and get your life together. You need to, you need to get your life right. You need to, you know, right? So I finally did. I did. I went back to the program that I was at when DeMarcus was killed. Rededicated my life to God. Got, you know, rededicated myself to becoming clean and sober. So I've been clean and sober for about two years now. Devante put his feet to the ground and just went in for his brother. And nobody can take that away from him. I don't give up what no, anybody says. And, and yeah, he went through the mental breakdown. And now he's on the mental build up. That's my baby. He went in the way his mama taught him to for his brother, the unjust, the wrongdoing that we have to live through, you know? I'm so proud of the man, the young man he's become. It's crazy, you know, how as a parent, I just look at him and I'm just, I just be in awe and just so proud that, that I'm like, that's my kid. <laughs> like, that's my baby. On March 22nd, just one day after police released audio and video of Stefan's killing, Stevante led a protest that would capture the nation's attention in the most unexpected way. All right, we continue with an extended Honda Kings pregame live. The start of the Kings Atlanta Hawks game has been delayed. Outside the windows here at Golden One Center, you see a protest going on just outside the entrance gates, and they are not letting any fans inside the building. As that protest continues, they will continue to delay the basketball game. Here you see inside Golden One Center, not many fans are able to get into the building. I remember Cairo being there and Stefan's baby mom being there. And we're standing next to this statue. There's a big Pikachu-looking statue up there. And we're standing on top of it. And I remember holding my nephew Cairo in my arms. He was looking at me like, who are you? Like, you are powerful. But as a baby, he was looking at me like that. I've never held Stefan's kid. And I want to prove a point that's all Stefan cared about. And I took my nephew and I held him up. 
And to see all those people at that arena saying my brother's name, thousands and thousands of people out there fighting for my brother, and I got his son in my arm. I'm like, nigga, that's they fight. They, they, this, they for your daddy, man. Your daddy. Like, they shut up basketball for your daddy. Like, for me, that was like Wakanda forever. You know what I mean? It was one of the most fucked up and most beautiful nights in my life. And one side of me, you got me thinking, look at my city. Look how strong we are. Look how we come together. We shut down kings and I'm so proud of my city. And to know that my brother's blood had to cause a ceasefire through his blood. We came together through his blood. It ruined it for me. Wait the fuck a minute. Where do you guys go after this? They say, go home and sleep. What do you do after, you know, your actionable items? Then I seen the King's owner come out. Uh, good evening, all. Thank you for your patience tonight. On Sunday, we had a horrific, horrific tragedy in our community. And on behalf of the players, the executives, ownership, and the entire King's family, I first of all wanted to express our deepest sympathies to the family. What happened was absolutely horrific. And we are so very sorry. We're so very sorry for your loss. I also wanted to say that we at the Kings recognized your people's ability to protest peacefully, and we respect that. We here at the Kings recognize that we have a big platform. It's a privilege, but it's also a responsibility. It's a responsibility that we take very seriously. And we stand here before you, old, young, black, white, brown, and we are all united in our commitment. <laughs> we recognize that it's not just business as usual, and we are going to work really hard to bring everybody together to make the world a better place, starting with our own community. And we're going to work really hard to prevent this kind of a tragedy from happening again. And he gave away a lot of money to these organizations. And the organizations promised never to protest the King's Arena. So I said, damn, look how easy it is to pay off our leaders. So after that, and we sat down with the Kings and had a meeting. And come to find out, the Kings come to be good partners. We don't hate the Kings. We love the Kings. Sometimes you got to shut down business as usual. And a little money ain't, ain't enough. Wearing his name on the jersey ain't enough. Helping in programs and creating programs would be more. But I think the Kings are doing the best they can. When the owner came out, I met the owner. We shared personal, private stories together. Vivek's a good guy. His heart's in the right place. You can never judge a book based on its cover. And um, that's all I'm going to say about him. Because he got a story. And I judged him for a minute. Because um, I didn't know him. But that brother got a story, you know. And I love him. So the Kings thing was good, but the freeway thing was big too. The freeway thing was huge. The kids wasn't there for that one, but I was there. The same day that Stavante and protesters were blocking entry into the Golden One Center, they also took to the Sacramento Freeway, shutting down Interstate 5 during rush hour. That's one of the proudest moments of my life. Sacramento rose up. This makes me cry. <laughs> Leaving from South Sacramento. As me and my friends got in my car and got on the freeway to go, I-5, it was gridlocked, where they shut it down for Stefan. We literally got out of our cars. So we just started partying on the freeway. I see everyone around me looks like me, and his, the energy was crazy. When I seen them shut that freeway down for my baby, 
that's when you believe in your culture. You believe in your people. And I know that I'm Papa's mom. It makes me proud. Sacramento has shown up and showed out in the name of Stephon Clark. And they did so peacefully, adhering to the wishes of Mama Clark. In the case with Stephon, within one week, I knew where both officers lived. I knew where their parents went to church. <laughs> I knew where they got their hair cut. I knew everything. People delivered that information to me. And so in DeMarcus's case, someone brought the law. But I was just like, don't do anything because God, I just knew that if I'm in the same situation twice, something didn't go right. I gotta do something different. So don't make any moves in my son's name. I went through, I went all through Sacramento to Oak Park, to the Heights, to the North Daniel, to the Mexican Greek gangs. Everybody wanted to move on Stefan because Stefan was that type of person. I had to go and have meetings where normally women aren't allowed to sit at these type of meetings and say, don't make any moves in my son's name. And I did that because I, I firmly believe that I'm doing it different. I'm going to trust God this time with my son's death. And I know that it's for something greater than us. After killing Stephon Clark, Sacramento police officers Jared Robinette and Terrence Mercado were interviewed by Internal Affairs about what happened the night they shot Stephon. They're pieces of shit. The saddest part for me was that I was privy to the interviews of the officers. So I got to see them being interviewed. And I have the files of their interrogations. I have it in my possession today. The black officer had the most sense of entitlement and the less amount of remorse in his actions towards the white officer. The white officer took a desk job after. The black officer still patrols the streets. The white officer was scared, nervous. He felt bad. The black one didn't. Almost exactly one year after Stefan's death, Sacramento County District Attorney Anne-Marie Schubert announced her office's decision on whether or not to charge the officers involved in Stefan's killing. Now, I'm going to talk about the cell phone evidence in this case. And before I get into that, I want to make a few comments. First of all, this evidence, the cell phone evidence, was conducted by both the Department of Justice as well as the Sacramento Police Department. They did what they called phone downloads and they provided that information to us. Some may wonder, especially today, why are we talking about this? Isn't this invasive? Isn't it disrespectful? But I will say this again. Our job, in truth, is to look at all the facts. If we're going to do our job correctly, we're going to consider all the facts, even the ones that are deeply personal, and even the ones that may be intimate, and even the ones that may be uncomfortable for us to talk about. In the cell phone evidence, that examination of his phone included phone calls, text messages, an email draft that was in a note form in his cell phone, internet searches. The cell phone examination revealed that there was an incident that happened on March 16th, two days before this, a domestic violence incident that happened with the mother of his children. Her name is Selena that weighed very heavily on his mind. What we know from the cell phone evidence is that in the 12 hours after that March 16th incident, Mr. Clark tried to call Selena 76 times, 76 times. We know that Mr. Clark made calls and texts to his probation officer, but because it was a weekend, he was not able to connect. We also know from the cell phone analysis that Mr. Clark searched the Sacramento District Attorney's website regarding domestic violence. We also know that he searched the Sacramento Police Department's online reporting system. We also know from his phone that he drafted an email to law enforcement denying this March 16th incident and stating, quote, I'm pretty scared I'm going to be put in jail. An email to law enforcement denying this March 16th incident and stating, quote, I'm pretty scared I'm going to be put in jail. There was also Many, many text messages that went back and forth between him and Selena. In those responses, Mr. Clark oftentimes denies that March 16 incident. And at other times, he's trying to salvage their relationship. 
and his family, quite frankly. In between these text messages, this is all occurring on Saturday the 17th. So we have Friday the 16th is the domestic violence incident. Saturday, March 17th is when these text messages are going on between the two of them. In between these text messages, Mr. Clark starts to search the internet. And those internet searches involve suicide. He searches over two dozen sites about how one can commit suicide. And the focus of those are primarily on how does one do it by drug ingestion. So when we look at all of these facts and circumstances, we look at all of it, everything. We ask our question that we started out with again. And that question is, was a crime committed? There's no question that human being died. But when we look at the facts and the law, and we follow our ethical responsibilities, the answer to that question is no. And as a result, we will not charge these officers with any criminal liability related to the shooting death and the use of force on Stefan's part. No, I never believed in the system, so I wasn't surprised. I was surprised at how she attacked my son's character. I was surprised at how she dealt with the situation. I was surprised at her calling me to a meeting and then refusing to tell me her decision at that meeting until I, there was those minutes of me walking out of the meeting. She's just a piece of work. Anne Marie Schubert is definitely not for the people. She's not a mother, so she did not know how to empathize. It just was all wrong. It just was all wrong. My mother's heart stopped on the day of her decision. Diane Schubert, when she said about my grandson, all that stuff about my grandson, my daughter said I died for some seconds, and they revived me back. My mother had a full heart attack the day of her decision, died in my face. I socked her in her chest. She came back to life. This is my real life. This, that's her real career. It's a difference. Career and your life are two different things. She was a piece of shit, straight up. My son calls her uh, Carol Baskins. <laughs> Carol Ann Marie Baskins. She made it a circus. She made it about her. What he did the night before, who he texted, his internet searches, none of that has nothing to do with the fact that all he had was a cell phone in my grandmother's backyard. Not only that, did we check the cops' cell phone records and internet searches and all that? So, such a one-sided thing, but we're used to them vilifying our loved ones after they murdered them. I knew she was going to assassinate his character because she had to make herself look right and him look wrong. She doesn't go into the officers. That would have made sense for me. Has she dove into the officer's phones the same way? Because we don't know what their state of mind was in going in and work that day. And that makes a difference. Logically and rationally, but just the fact that she did it against my son, who was the victim, seems so unfair. By revealing Stefan's intimate text messages with the mother of his children, it seemed like the DA was trying to insinuate that Stefan had wanted police to kill him as a way to commit suicide. In doing so, the DA also referenced the fact that Stefan had recently spent time in jail and he was afraid to go back. He already been in jail. He already know what that was like. This is bigger than me and bigger than my brother. As much as I hate to say it's bigger than my brother. I hate to say that. I really do. I hate to say that because sometimes I don't want to say it's bigger than him at all. Damn it. But I know it is. We got so many people I need to live, you know what I mean? You know, it's a basic right, you know? And I think jail changed him. You know, as a young kid going to jail, Sacramento County Jail, that changes you. He was in there fighting over Pop-Tarts and shit. Young, beautiful. You imagine getting your nails done every week. You can't get your nails done in jail. Ain't no barber shop in jail for your ass every week. All them luxury things you had, gone. And he go in there and he's hella loud. His energy's so loud. You know what I mean? So I can imagine how much of a target he was in jail. Because the loudest person in jail, they want to quiet up the quickest, is what I noticed. You know, we go into these institutions and you come out a broken person. A person that don't want to be happy no more. Because you realize that the cost of freedom ain't really free. 
You know, Stefan signed up for it, but I don't think he knew what he signed up for. They live these lifestyles, and then they're incarcerated into this system. You're a slave now once you become that inmate, and your brother is not your brother in there, as you would think, you know, as it should be. But it's you for yourself, and you realize you're all alone, you have nobody. So when Stefan got out of jail, I realized how much that changed him. I couldn't tell you his dreams and aspirations no more because that glow was gone. He done seen some shit. I don't know what happened in there. I know he's seen the devil. I could tell because he came out a lot different. The energy was gone. In jail, especially Sacramento County Jail, will do that to people. He had been in jail. He was fresh out of jail when he right before he got killed. And so what's so ironic about when he came home from jail this time was that he made amends with me as far as he was my hardest critic about the druggies. Uh, he had finally come to terms with prioritizing his life, finding out what was important to him and what wasn't. So he had realized that being a father was his most important goal. So he decided to support Selena in her life choices and just be a stay-at-home dad. And it was working for them. They had their ups and downs. They had just come to a place, I thought, where they were going to be okay. So it was just sad to see things go the way that they did. The Clark family had a lot of support after Stefan was killed. However, there were also opportunistic community members. Oh, God, yes. Jamelia Land, Pastor Simmons, Tanya Faison, those three members of the community who led organizations of the community totally took advantage of the Clark family and the name and the resources and monies that came through our name and our, and our laws. And I'm not afraid to call them out by name because right is right and wrong is wrong. Now, there were some other members of the community that stood by us from the gate. Jackie Rose of the Rose Family Creative Empowerment Center, day one, she goes hard for the Clark family. And Margaret Fortune of the Fortune Schools, day one. To Coy Porter of Genesis Church, day one. Reverend Al Sharpton, National Action Network, day one. So here's a true story. Three days after Stefan was killed, I came to my mom's house. And so I'm upstairs, I'm crying. Savante's here. He's like, Mama, Mama, Al Sharpton's on the phone. I'm like, boy, you don't even know who Al Sharpton is. Like, what? Give me the phone, right? I'm like, hello? He's like, Miss Clark? He's like, is there anything I can do for you? And I'm like, yeah, can you do the eulogy? Because my pastor who did my first two children, she's deceased now. And he's like, I'll be, you know, I'll be more than glad to. So he came and did the eulogy. So after the eulogy, he looked at me, he said, when all the cameras are gone, and ain't nobody around. If you need anything, call me. I said, okay. So about two months later, all the cameras was gone. So after Stefan was killed, three days later, I had to move out of my place. Three days later, me, Jalen, the grandbaby, my daughter, we had to move out of my place. I didn't have a place to stay. All of a sudden, I'm homeless, you know. I called Reverend Sharpton. And he was like, what's going on? How can I help you? I was like, I need a place to live. I need some money to get me a place. He overnighted me a check. That's how I was able to buy the motorhome. And I just was like, from that moment forward until today, he's a phone call away. He's really like the uncle that, you know, you look for. He's really a solid character. Anything I ask of him, he's just right there. No questions asked. Al Sharpton, you know, we love the Rev. The Rev has been there since day uno. As real as they come. Hal Sharpton, big bro, my guy. What I've learned from watching him is worth more than what money can buy. Sharpton has taught me composure. He has taught me speaking skills. You know, just watching him move has taught me a lot. It's fucked up that there's not that many Al Sharptons out here trying to fight for our people the way he's fighting for our people, you say what you want, but he shows up whenever he's called. At least he's been there for the Clark family. So we're forever appreciative. And families feel different about Al Sharpton. Some of them are like, man, fuck him. No, we love him. He's been there since I called him. He's never asked us for anything. He's just always been there to be of service and 
just like I said with the Jackie Rose family, the NAACP here in Sacramento, uh, Sonia Lewis, uh, Black Lives Sacramento. She was with Black Lives Matter Sacramento, but they ended up dissolving the Sacramento chapter because of Tanya Faison, who got all this money in my son's name, bought a house, a car, quit a job, all this stuff. There's been a lot of good and there's been a lot of bad. Oh, Donya Diaz, which is um, Jay-Z's other mother. She's the bomb. She helps me a lot. I believe that they really accurately told the story of Stefan, paid homage to him. I, I just love it. Um, I was just with Carl Granderson, which is a family friend. Uh, he plays for the Saints, and he wears Stefan's name on his helmet. And But him and Stefan were friends. I mean, they were calling to their cousins, you know. They rap together. They play football together, you know. And so, yeah, he's still wearing Stefan's name on his helmet. So I just love it. A lot of people reached out. Diddy. Hung up on Diddy. I was down. I was grieving. Uh, something happened. I think I just hung up. I forgot what happened. I hung up on Diddy. But I talked to Chris Weber. I forget all the people, you know. But we got calls from everywhere. That basketball player paid for the funeral. The man called me up, and he said, I give my condolences. So I said, oh, you're my grandson's cousin. And everybody was saying, you didn't know who he was? I said, no, I thought that was DeMarcus' cousin. He said, DeMarcus' cousin. And then everybody was cracking up. He was there for us. Even the one for the Raiders for the reception. Eric, somebody. So quite one of oxtails, he got her beef oxtails. Anything that we wanted, they paid for it. Matt Barnes, he gave money to us to kids for college. Matt Barnes has been just the best when it comes to the kids starting the scholarship funds. Matt Barnes doesn't give enough credit in the movement that he deserves, but we love Matt Barnes. Matt Barnes is amazing. Just, just an amazing brother that we are so proud to have with us. Ben Crump been there since day one. Ben Crump is my brother. He's the new Thurgood Marshall. He's Black America's Attorney General. I love Ben. I Lee Merritt, that's my nigga too. Lee don't get enough credit. It's all right. You know what I mean? Lee don't care. Lee Merritt and Ben Crump, those are my favorite attorneys. I got a special love for Ben. That's my shiny bald head nigga. But I love brother Ben, man. Ben Crump is just so amazing, bro. You know, he's one of the busiest people I know. He fights for so many families. I don't know how he does it. He's taken so many sacrifices for the movement. I don't know if you understand. Ben Crump is like totally giving his life to our people. I pray for him. I don't want him to burn out. Because if Ben Crump gone, we fucked. People talk shit about Ben, but <laughs> imagine a world without Ben Crump for black people. You'll never find nobody that work as hard for our people as Ben Crump when it comes to this this law. Nobody. And then they get the ridicule, the judgment, the hate, the mail. You can't see your family for months. Because you, you niggas dying every day. I, you can have the money. I don't want that shit. If that's what the price of it, I don't want it. Ben gets the love and respect. Nick Cannon has been great. Assembly member Shirley Weber has been, of course, amazing. So many great people that we've had help with. Um, Paul Blanco, Habitat for Humanity. You know, I can name a million people that we've just had incredible support from. You know, all our donors and sponsors. And Zion, my business partner. My name is Zion Tadessa, and I'm friend of the Clark family. I'm from Ethiopia, all the way from Africa. Yes, but I've been here since 2001. So I've been living in Sacramento for 20 years. I'm a restaurant owner. I also have a Shiba farm in Shashamani. I'm also a partner with Stevante on I Am Sac event and I Am Sac foundation. Ever since I met him, it's been like over two years. We've just been working hard, trying to unite the community, work with the community, make the politician accountable. The I Am Sac foundation, what is it about? And then when you tell them in the I am SAC 6, people understand in a simplest way. The SAC 6 program changed everything for me. I had it in a vision. I said, I'm going to work as Stefan Clark's communications director. And he's my guy, my boss. If I work for Stefan, everything I do for my brother, this is a family business. And we do this for our last name, not our first name. 
Mm-hmm. So since I do this for a family thing, I need a mission statement. Now, Stefan said, I need a sack six. In order to prevent what happened to me, you got to fix the problem you have with us. He said, 10 days after you jumped on the mayor's desk, you said three things, but people didn't hear it. He said, you said the rent's too high, the gang banging has to stop, and the poverty is uncontrollable. He said, nobody heard that because of the way you made your entrance. He said, so before you start talking about preventing my shit from happening, you need to start preventing us, the Marcuses, from happening. I said, what you mean? He said, before you worry about me, don't forget DeMarcus, because every time you say Stefan Clark, you say DeMarcus. That taught me to bridge the gap between community and community before I bridge the gap between law enforcement and community. And that means we come together as black people despite geographical locale, despite who got the biggest house, the biggest cars, the most money, who signed the who rap label, whatever, you know, until we are able to come together as a people, as a community to prevent DeMarcus's from happening, Stefan's will continue to happen. Until we stop the community violence, the police violence will continue to happen because they will realize we have no order in our communities. We have no structure. We have no uniform. We have no organization. We have, we, are, we do not think as one. We don't, we, we think as I. So when Stefan said, you know, number one is bridge the gap, I said, okay, the bridge is used to take us places where we cannot get to. I cannot get this place without a bridge. He said, you begin the dialogue. That's the way to begin the bridge. Begin the dialogue on how to prevent this from happening. Begin the dialogue on, on how we can come together for a ceasefire. Begin the dialogue on how we can come together for a day for the kids. Begin the dialogue. Because without the dialogue, you have nothing. Then he said, well, number two. Number two is policy and legislative change. I see policy and legislative change is legacy on paper. The California Act of Saved Lives, Stefan Clark Law, AB 392, a law named after my son, you know, it holds police accountable for using excessive violence and force. It's just awesome. There are officers in court right now. One officer name is Joseph Lamisha. He's in fighting a case right now for a murder he did in Modesto of the man named Trevor Seaver. There's another officer in San Diego facing a court over the death of a loved one. He's facing time under Stefan Clark Law. So when I think of Stefan Clark Law, I think of officers thinking twice before you kill our loved ones. Stefan Clark Law is watered down. Slow progress is better than no progress. And I remember Gavin Newsom telling me in my face that when California sneezes, the rest of America catches a cold. He said, this is going to change some things. So when I thought about legacy on paper, I thought of my brother's name living on for generations and generations. That was why number two was so important, because even if we die, they'll still know his name through his law that has been implemented and signed by Governor Gavin Newsom. So number three was provide resources and healing spaces. If we as a people don't have a 24-hour hub, a 24-hour resource center, a rec center, a museum, and a library because you cannot lead if you do not read. If we don't have something called Stefan's house, George Floyd's house, Breonna Taylor's house, Ahmaud Aubrey's house, one in every undeserved community across the nation because these houses are like churches, people coming here respect and love. These are not religious entities. These are houses of the movement. So if you have cultural centers that are 24 hours resourced and rec centers and museums to go learn about the lives and legacies, not just of George Floyd's, but the little George Floyd's that you never get to see, you get a name for those peoples in those houses. You get something where they can come get clothes and food and learn coding and and, and, and have a studio so they can do their music, have therapy rooms, have game rooms. When you have books they can check out and take home, when you have something, a system designed and created for them through a loved one's name, that you can have the hearts and the minds of the people. It's about building. Are we building our community? Are, are we building our children, our education, our health and wellness, you know, our mental health, our physical health, spiritual health, as well as, you know, as well as financial health. I think that's what we're all about. How do we build that from the grounds up? We can't wait for the system to help us, we have to help ourselves. So I think that's the whole point of Stefan's house and what we do for Stefan's legacy. So people can see also and say, oh, if they can do it, we can do it too. If she can do it, why can't I do it? So inspiration is what is missing in our community. So 
I think what we're doing, this is just the beginning of it. Stefan Sauce, this is just a seed right now we're planting. I call number four the wraparound services because all wraps around this service. And that's commemorating the life and legacy of my dear brother, Stefan Alonzo Clark, so that his name may live on in a positive light for generations and generations and generations long after you and I have left this earth. Everything I do, I do for Stefan Alonzo Clark. And I'll tell people in a heartbeat that it's bigger than me. It's bigger than Stefan. When I say Stefan, I'm saying a lot of names. So number five is receive recommendations from the people on how to prevent Stefan from happening again, how to prevent George Floyd from happening again, how to prevent Ahmaud Arbery's. Because if I want to commemorate his life and legacy in a positive light, I have to make sure that your other families don't have to go through what our family went through. Number six is the golden rule, I believe. Spread the gospel of love. I believe everybody love everybody. And because Semi Pro is my favorite movie and I love Jackie Moon. So everybody love everybody. So that's why we created the Sack Six and that's my vision. You had to create something for Stefan through Stefan that goes with Stefan. So anybody that's listening to this podcast, if you didn't know what I just said because I was too drawn out, number one is bridge the gap between law enforcement and at risk community. But first, we got to do community community. Number two is inform and educate on policy and legislative change. Number three is to provide resources and healing spaces for those in our communities. Number four is to commemorate the life and ongoing legacy of my dear brother Stefan Clark in a positive light. Number five is to receive recommendations from you, the people, how to prevent Stefan Clark from ever happening again. And number six is spreading the gospel of love. Everybody, love everybody. Sorry about that. I'm a little... My mama called me Deacon Long when didn't, so I apologize, <laughs> brother. Get a little passionate in myself. <laughs> As we interviewed Mama Clark, just steps away from where Stefan was killed, she pointed out another piece of her son's legacy. So right behind us is Coral Gables apartment. This has been a bad complex, like a project type area. Right on the other side of that lot is the Stefan Clark playground. There's never been a playground for those kids over there, ever. They're building the Stefan Clark School. That brings tears to my eyes. They're going to name a, a school after my son? Like, that's big. And so knowing Stefan, right? <laughs> and he's like, what? A school, bro? <laughs> he's so juiced, you know? Like, I know he can see it. After Stefan was killed, Mama Clark attempted to die by suicide. In that moment, she heard the voice of God letting her know that there was so much more for her to live for. And now she truly understands what she was meant to do. I thought my only purpose in life was to be a good mom and raise my kids to be good, to be good people, to make a difference. I, I thought my children would be the ones to make the difference. And I was okay with that, you know? But the fact that I know I heard the voice of God telling me that <laughs> I still had work to do that I couldn't die. So I counted it an honor that he's chosen us to work for him. <laughs> like, I don't think it gets any bigger than that. I truly believe Stevante's purpose is to be the voice for his brother. I believe that in my whole heart. To stand up for what's right and to, you know, change the wrong. But I believe that my purpose is to really give a voice to the mother who has lost her child. To teach her how to learn, to grow, to heal so that once the mother learns, grows, and heals, the family will learn, grow, and heal. This community, the city, the state, the nation, the world, all of the traumas that we've had leading up to this, it's like it all meant something. So the yayo is my purpose. So I had a song that I used to listen to by Erica Badu all the time, uh, coming up as a mom with my children. So yeah, there's a song called Yayo. Yayo. I can't sing, yay. <laughs> it's the Erica Badu song. It's on her, that one album, Baduism, with Tyrone. Coming up, raising my children. My kids knew if I played that song, it was time to get up and wash walls. It was time, it was, you know, spring cleaning day. It was a day that mama wasn't playing, because I'm the mom, and you come from me. I nourish you from my body. So this is what the song says. If you want to find rest, come and rest on my breast, and where I give you life, I feed you from this, you know what I'm saying? It's always a song that's touched me, so in my darkest of hours, with Stefan with Jamarcus, I would play that song and it just would minister to my heart. I and mean, it would make sense of it. And I can choose to look at the sunlight and the sunrise and not look at all of the sadness. Because it's not a real word, it's, it's her take on the word yeye, which is mother in Swahili. So yeyo is not a real word. 
and said, okay, this is going to be our word. Yayo is a mother who's lost a child. Because a lot of people hear Yayo and think of no, Tony, get to Yayo. <laughs> but Yayo, that way is spelled Y-A-Y-O. But Yayo, the Erica Badu way, is spelled Y-E-Y-O. So it's a different spelling. So for me, a Yayo is not just a mother who lost her child to police violence or community violence. It could have been to miscarriage. It could have been to SIDS or COVID. However, the fact that I've lost three different children in three different manners. Each emotion was different, but the same. When the mother's broken, there's no hope for the family because the whole family gravitates to the mom. It's right for us to heal from traumatic experiences. It's right for me to address the emotions and the feelings that I experienced dealing with the trauma that I've experienced. And then once I acknowledge them, then I can address them. And then I can heal from them, right? It's a natural process to things. I say this a lot, that our culture tends to normalize trauma. And that's our biggest enemy. We have to stop normalizing the things that are wrong. We have to stop normalizing the bad things that we go through. It's not okay to watch somebody get their head blowed off at a dice game. And I saw that. I, I wiped brains off my arm. G Parkway, I went through it. I was in the car and I'm actually with a guy. And he was a youngster and this OG was mad because he was playing his music loud and walked up to him and blew his brains out right next to me. That's not normal. What the? The nightmares? Let's talk about the nightmares after that shit. I firmly believe that that's my purpose in life now is to help heal the mom so that the moms can help heal the family. And I count it all joy in that. None of my children's deaths were in vain. Because they all mattered. All their lives mattered. That's my goal is to make sure everybody knows it. The guilt that comes to a mother when her child dies supersedes any guilt you'll ever experience, that any human being will ever experience. The bargaining and the guilt. I could have done this. I should have done this. I should have been here. I should have told them that. I should have told them this. If I would have called, if I would have showed up, if I would have had this, if I would have been in my own house, if they would have been at their house, if all that is enough to drive you insane. I've been in and out of therapy to no success. This is the first time in my life that I found a therapist that was culturally competent, which is important, and that was young and fresh enough to help, to, to build with me, to, okay, ask me the questions. Where do you want to be? How do you want to be? What is your goal? What is the successful sequet? I was stoked, bro. Like, I, I say bro because I, I used to say nigga all the time. <laughs> So now I say bro, so that's where the bro comes in. Just know me, that bro really means nigga. <laughs> now Mama Clark is still here. And I think she has a special anointance over her life that a lot of mothers in the movement even don't have. The way Mama Clark is able to do it, and I think it's because she didn't just lose a child to police. She lost a child to the community as well before she lost a child to the police. And then when she lost DeMarcus, we were all in foster care at the time. And instead of losing her mind, she actually got her life together, like something I've never seen before. So when Stefan died, at first she was grieving. And she couldn't really do what she was called to do because she was in her grieving stage. And we all grieve differently. You know, she could have went into the sixth stage of grief. People don't know if that, that's revenge. She could have went to that, but she didn't. She stepped into her purpose. And that's why I've always said passion without direction is chaos, and passion with the direction is purpose. And Mama Clark is the living, walking manifestation of that quote when it comes to passion with direction is purpose. You've seen what she was able to do with the Justice Tree brand, what she was able to do with Stefan's house, you know, and Stefan Clark Law. I've done a lot of work on these things, but a lot of this work was implemented into me from my mother. A lot of people don't know that. The quotes you hear a lot came from Mama Clark as well. A lot of my speech dynamics, the way I talk, come from Mama Clark as well. A lot of me come from her and a lot of the things that I do. The things that I've taken from her has been able to take my activism to another level, as well as my music. I do music as well. But back in the day, before she was saved, before she was Mama Clark, before she was Mrs. Clark, the mother of Stefan Clark, she was Sequette Clark Black, 
from Garden Block Crips, Meadowview, and she didn't take no shit, you know what I mean? She'd bite your ear off, run you over. She could be verbally abusive, um, very physically abusive. She could be that person. Back in the day, she was a real G. So when I look at it like that, with my mom being such a aggressive figure, and somebody I thought, well, this is how it's supposed to be. It's a change in her life, being more of a passionate figure, taking that aggressive and, and, and tone it down, knowing how to take her 10 to a 2. Growing up, I didn't know she knew how to take her 10 to a 2. Now I see her. There's a such thing as righteous anger. And Mama Clark has articulately put that out there through her actions. She, she's angry, yeah, of course, but it's righteous anger. So that way she can fulfill her purpose and our purpose on a higher level. Any mother that could lose two children and a daughter, childbirth, and still be out here fighting for other people's families, that's unheard of. And when you lose your son to the police, you're reminded of that every day through the mainstream media, through the radio, through the newspapers. You gotta understand, even when she's seen me, it's always a constant reminder of how they killed her son. A lot of families are different. We are in the family class, in the, in the movement families, there's families like Sean Monterosa, Miles Hall, Marshall Miles, Nakia Taylor, things like that, like different types of people. But when it comes to families like Stefan Clark, Mike Brown, Oscar Grant, Trayvon Martin, we're relived by these by mainstream medium on a constant basis. How many people around the nation you think know the name Stefan Clark? Then and now, how many people you think know the name around the nation, Sara Monterosa. I'm saying that's a good thing. You don't want everybody saying your name like that because you don't want to be constantly reminded of the death of your life. I'd rather Stefan name be, is not on the mainstream media because I'm not reminded by his death so constantly. I wish he was one of them names that, that nobody knew. I wish people just knew my name fighting for his brother. I don't think people understand the constant reminders. The families who have to deal with these on a mainstream level have to go with when it comes to the images of watching their loved one killed all over, over again. Stevante mentioned Sean Monterosa, another family that has told their story in our Say Their Name Clubhouse room. In Vallejo, California, on June 2nd, 2020, 22 year old Sean Monterosa was unarmed and kneeling with his hands in the air when Detective Jared Tawn shot through the windshield of his police car, killing Sean. Detective Tawn has been involved in four shootings in five years. Residents call him one of the Fatal 14, those officers who have been frequently involved in shootings of civilians in the Bay Area. But the Monterosa family is just one of the many families the Clark family is connected with. The Monterosa family, those are my babies. Michelle, that's my baby girl. Both her and her sister, they're, you know, they're awesome. The Seaver family, Kyle Seaver, in honor of his brother Trevor, who was killed. Roxanne Morales for her son, Augustine Morales, who was killed by the police. Marshall Miles, his mother Latanya is one of my yayos. Frances Navarez, her daughter Gabriela Navarez, was killed by the Citrus Heights Police Department out here in Sacramento. Gabby and Stefan and Stevante were friends, and she was killed by the police. Her mother and I have connected, and she's a yayo. So yeah, there's a lot of families that definitely that I've connected with based on what happened to my son. Even with all the other families the Clarks are helping, they're still very focused on their personal fight on behalf of Stefan. It made sense to me why DeMarcus got killed. Because that was his lifestyle. As ugly as it is, that's the life. I get it. But we changed everything after DeMarcus got killed. I stopped letting drug dealers and gangbangers around my boys. I started glamorizing education and high school diplomas and career choices and, and college or university. And I started, that literally fixed the problem. So why am I going through the same fucking thing again, right? That's the thing that broke us. That's the thing that snapped because we changed. Now it's supposed to be better. And then here come the police who are unfightable. Now the police take one of mine. And so it's like, it was like the audacity of it, right? But that's what ignited the fire in the fight. It's because how dare you get at me like this? And we changed and we did the right thing. And now look, and still, 
I tell people all the time, I was like, the, the city of Sacramento owes me until I die. And they can never pay the debt because you can't put a price on the life of my child. So anything I come to you about, you better just turn it over. That's why we're going to have this street changed to the Stefan A. Clark Street. Because you owe me that. You owe that to us. You owe me anything I want in this city, y'all owe me. Because you killed my baby for no reason. For no fucking reason, you killed my son. So, yeah, run it. And you can't buy his life. I will never settle. I'm not one of them settling mamas. You can buy the bullets that you put in my baby. You can buy them back. You can give me a million dollars per bullet. Eight went into his body. You can give me that. But as far as settling, never. His life was priceless. Me as the mother, I have a suit against the city. And them as the children had a suit against the city. And so they settled for the 2.4 um, with a different attorney than ours. And... Although we were sat at the same table, it's still separate. Because we were doing the depositions pre-COVID and then COVID. And so now everything is just like, we're waiting to start back up. They offered, I think, about $2 million for me, my mom, my dad, and my husband. And I just was like, I don't think they get the point that it's not about the money. It's about you admitting to your wrongdoing. But I'm not signing anything that says I settle. Sorry. It wouldn't be me. I'm a Clark, and that's not how I do it. The Clark family knows how to hustle, and when it comes to fighting for justice, they found a new way to raise awareness and funds. The weed, of course, the cannabis. Justice tree. It's the freedom to live, the freedom to grow, and the freedom to be. Because he was a true pothead, which is why I even got into the cannabis industry. I know he just would be so elated to know that he has a weed named <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of that, make sure y'all go to them cannabis clubs and go get that justice tree. Please go get that. Because that right there, I smoked some of it. My damn self I was hiding the mile. It's in your local cannabis store, especially at the cookie store on J Street, man. Y'all go over there. You know, they got them in the little, the little pre-rolls right now. But the flower coming too. Mama Clark told me the flower coming. Go get it. Trust me, my name is Andre Young, and Stefan Clark is my little cousin. But other than that, I just want to shout out everybody from the family. You know, the ones that said, nah, we want justice. That's why I still love the fact that she came out with that, uh, that weed strand justice tree. I love that shit. And they're also using more traditional ways to get justice and accountability. For me, it's all about being informed and educated about what's on the ballot so that we can all make a conscious decision to vote on the ballot. And so that's where, of course, I'm Sac Foundation comes in again with the, our era of the vote, where we edu educate, register, and assist the uninformed voter. It's all about knowledge. Being a voter, making sure that your voice is heard and your vote is counted. Recently, Stavante passed along his role as CEO of the I Am Sac Foundation to his mother, Mama Clark. You know, I feel like she was ready to step into her manifestation. That's my way of that, giving her something that she can have and run as her own. Stavante is still in his 20s. He was making a lot of life choices or decisions that were affecting the name of the foundation. And so in order to prevent that, he chose to step down, which is responsible. And I chose to step up because I'm in a position to use my experience, my age, and my wisdom, present the foundation the way it needs to be presented. We definitely work together. It's a family foundation. How I raise my kids. The Clarks, we're all we got. I'm you and you're me, so it's not like he's still the CEO, even though I'm the CEO. We're one and the same when it comes to this type of thing. That's how they're, that's how they're raised, you know. We're going to make a conscious decision as a family, not as an individual. My little sister, Kaylin, you ask her what she want to do, she'll tell you she want to run I Am Sac Foundation. That's the kind of stuff we're trying to do here. When I stepped down, my reputation was kind of tarnished, of course, because of everything I've done. I'm not going to lie to you. I've been canceled since day one. Everything I do is under the microscope. I'm always in the spotlight. You don't just get the good in me. You get the all of me. I think that's why people like me so much, because they know you get the good, you get the bad, you get the whole human experience with Stavante Clark. With that comes me knowing when to step down. 
true leaders know when to step down. There's so much work to be done, but the family of Stefan Clark is putting together sustainable approaches to fighting these kinds of injustices. First thing amongst everything is do not, do not explain or justify or defend your child and the death. Either they were wrong for killing your child or they weren't. You know, I think that a lot of people, a lot of families get caught up in trying to justify or explain their their loved one. And that's not what it's about. The fact of the matter with Stefan is that he was gunned down by the police while only holding his cell phone, period. So I think that our culture tends to allow them to give a narrative of wrongdoing. We feel the need to explain or justify, let that go. Either it was right or it was wrong. And that's what you go off of and you don't stop. The last thing I want to say is, do it for your last name. It'll matter more in the long run. Not a day go by, I don't say the name Stefan Clark. I want your kids, 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 kids to know his name. So hopefully it prevents from what happened to him to ever happen again. That's what I leave the people with. And actionable items. What are you going to do? Because if you're just protesting and talking about what we need to do, you're part of the problem. We don't need you. And for these young folks that want to fight and help the people, if you're not helping them, praying for them, giving them constructive criticism to fight for the movement and do better, leave them the fuck alone. I just want to let everybody know that, you know, I am psychfoundation.com. Donate. We need your help. For Stefan's house. Keep it going. We're the only one of its kind museum, library, resource, and rec center. A resource center because we believe give a man a fish, eat for a day, teach him to fish, he'll eat for a lifetime. The rec center because you need somewhere to, to chill, relax. A museum because you need to learn about the life and legacy of Stefan Clark, George Floyd, DeMott, Aubrey, so on and so forth. And the library because we believe you cannot lead if you do not read. So make sure you donate to imstackfoundation.com to help with the sustainability aspect of Stefan's house and the Clark family. And become a member, you know, by becoming a member get involved and a member you can go to iamstackevents.org we have a magazine too our magazine is digital it's on iamstackevents.org so if you want to become a member and you want to get a magazine of the legacy pamphlet the voice for the voiceless magazine i just created to come real life and legacy in a positive light if you're a family you want to be featured into the legacy pamphlet please 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 go to iamstackfoundation.com or iamstackevents.org this is uh stefan's house everything about it, it screams community everything you need is just survive build a safe place for kids a place where like young adults and teenagers can like function without having to worry about their life or anything like you know it's a studio you can make music here and a whole bunch of stuff games like just to give kids something to do because like we don't have that there's no guidance for us we all lost out here and i feel like this place is sort of like a lighthouse i want to lace you up and create a safe place for people to operate, for people to do stuff, for people to chase their dreams, goals, and ambitions and shit. I would like everyone to know that Stefan Alonzo Clark existed. He was human. He was loved. He got that smile that would just, oh my God, that smile. It gets you every time. He's funny, but the boy is so intelligent. That's my grandson, little papa. Thank you for listening to Say Their Name, Stefan Clark. After the tragedy of what happened to Stefan Clark, the Sacramento Police Department has updated its policies around body camera use and foot pursuits, even though stronger policies and accountabilities are still needed. Please remember to join and support the I Am SAC Foundation at I A M S A C F O U N D A T I O N dot com. I Am SAC Foundation and support their upcoming events at IamSACEvents.org. Please remember to contact your local officials to demand that they ban qualified immunity. We need to ban qualified immunity on a national scale, but remember to call your local officials to get it banned in your state. Special thank you to the family of Stefan Clark. We appreciate you for sharing your story.
Names of the fallen mentioned in these episodes. Trevor Seaver. Ahmad Arbery. Sean Monterosa. George Floyd. Miles Hall. Marshall Miles. Nakia Taylor. Mike Brown. Oscar Grant. Trayvon Martin. Augustine Morales. Gabriela Navarez. Stefan Clark. And a special thank you to our DCP Entertainment team. Co-host and executive producers, Chris Colbert and myself, Adele Coleman. Editor and sound design, Byron Hunt. Producers, Heather Johnson, Ryan Woodall, and Mike DuBose. And associate producer, Quentin Hill. <laughs>